Could. Could. It's great to be here today. It's been uh, probably over a year since I was here. And uh, the last time I was here, I'm sure you're still wrestling with the hand grenade that I launched in at the end when I asked you to reconsider the definition of a missionary and the old adage that everyone is a missionary. And I'm sure you've been wrestling with that exclusively since the last time I was here. So, um, But every time I come in here, I remember when I went to Bible college. And I went to Bible college not because I thought they knew everything and they were going to get me all sorted out theologically. I went because I was passionate about ministry. And try as they might, for five years, they did not squelch that. I trust that uh, your journey is um, going to be the same. And now I'll never get asked to come again, but that's all right. That's probably why it's been over a year. I want to uh, start today with a question. And uh, there's um, a book for you if uh, you answer this question. But what about global mission? What issue in global mission gets you fired up? makes you want to go make a difference in the world. A few examples just to get you thinking, and you can use one of these if, if you like, but maybe it's rescuing girls off the street. SIM has a project that does that in India and Bangladesh. There's India, there's uh, the girl that we want to give a choice in Jesus' name. Maybe it's feeding the hungry. Those kids are in uh, Zambia. I was there uh, last January and had the privilege of uh, being a part of uh, helping feed them, doing a kid's ministry and all that with a team from a local church around here. Maybe it's curing AIDS or helping, not curing AIDS, but helping people have hope that have AIDS, that are uh, dying, their families are shattered, those kinds of things. Those pictures are uh, people in Thailand that I visited when I was over there a couple of years ago. So whatever that issue for you is, the one in global mission that gets you excited, I want to know what that is real quickly. I've got time for five of you, and it's one sentence or less, just a couple words, really. I just passed out a book that has been floating around on my tables for about three and a half years. I was really excited when I bought it, but I couldn't get rid of any of them, so now I have no more of those books. <laughs> anyway, it, it is an excellent book, and it's got some uh, really good stuff in it, but uh, I want um, you to consider we all have a certain view of what mission is and what we're excited about, and, and I'm excited about the answers. I actually do feel like I probably don't even need to give the rest of my talk with some of those answers that just came out. but. Our view has been informed by our own experiences and the experience of others, our denominational bias. Sometimes even scripture uh, can uh, form, help form those views. But there's a, pressure, a present trend in mission that uh, I believe is very concerning. I call it a trend, but it's actually nothing new. It's more of a pendulum that, sw that swings back and forth over centuries. I could spend my whole 20 minutes today talking about rescuing girls off the street or feeding the hungry or uh, giving hope to those whose lives have been wrecked by AIDS. And you would be inspired and challenged and many of you uh, would be excited enough you would think, oh, we need to do something about that. When people inquire with SIM about wanting to serve as a missionary, most of the inquiries that we get are people wanting to go help girls get off the street to go and minister in a hospital, to go take care of orphans, and all those kinds of things. And those things are not bad, but I very seldom, in fact, I can't remember the last time I had an inquirer, and I sat down with them, and they said, I want to go and share the gospel with people who do not know. It just, it doesn't happen. Neil, am I, am I right? Have you had any of those lately? Maybe you're sitting there thinking, but hang on a minute. Uh, uh, I heard about a guy from World Relief called Clive Calvert, and he said this, it's hard to share the gospel with someone when they're dead. Okay? That's very true, and that has informed some of our thinking along these lines. And maybe you're going to take a spiritual approach and say, okay, but didn't Jesus feed the hungry, heal the sick, and aren't there heaps of passages about caring for the needs of the poor, like this one here? Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor, he sent me to proclaim freedom for prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed. Yes, Jesus did do all those things. And there's heaps of scriptures, not long enough today to go through all of them. In fact, I've got an hour-long presentation about why we should be involved in those things as Christians. And Christians should be leading the way in those things. But the reason for being concerned is 
that we are living in a day and age where the pendulum has swung to the side of social justice in such a way that it's almost to the exclusion of evangelism and church planting. It's become easier to demonstrate the love of Christ, which is extremely important, and as we're proclaiming, we should be demonstrating. But it's not socially acceptable to proclaim the love of Christ. See, good works are welcomed by everyone. Secularists, humanists, Islamists, Buddhists, agnostics, even atheists will get excited if we're doing good things in society. One of the pictures I showed you earlier was actually taken in Thailand at a uh, Buddhist temple grounds where they are doing tremendous things to help inform and educate about HIV and AIDS and to help families that are suffering and all those things. In fact, as I walked through this place, I was astounded, and it made me check my own thinking about uh, other religions and what they're doing good in the world. And they're doing things that we're not doing. And it was amazing to see the impact they were having. But the problem is, we can, everybody can be doing this and calling people to a moralistic lifestyle. But when we do it in Jesus' name, it becomes another story. Proclaiming the message of the gospel is another matter still. And this has been around since the early church. In Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 9, it says, One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, three in the afternoon. It says, Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, Look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking around and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This is great stuff. I don't know if you've ever looked at this passage through the eyes of doing good to human need, ministering to human need. But Peter and John are busy. They're on their way to the temple to pray, which is a good thing for believers to be doing. And they saw this man, and they helped deliver someone who was hurting. They healed him through the power of Christ. And that drew a crowd of amazed people wanting to know what just happened. We could have, Peter could have taken, Peter and John could have taken several roads or pathways with that question, what's just happened here? But Peter showed to share the truth of the gospel. If you look at verse 12 and onwards, it says, When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why are you looking at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you all can see. Peter lost his mind. He was there. He had a perfect opportunity to set up a ministry of healing the sick. And that could have gone for years and years and years. And there would have been people that followed him. And Western churches would have supported him to do that work. Even if he never said anything about Jesus. But they want to know what happened. And Peter's focus went way away from the crippled man that was now walking around. And he said, you guys killed Jesus. And there's hope for you because Jesus died because Jesus loved you. He didn't mince words about the gospel or what it was all about. He never lost focus on what was really uh, important. They ministered to human need but never forgot what the priority was. Acts chapter 4, the religious leaders grabbed them. They put them in prison on the next day. And then in verse 7 it says, They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? They weren't concerned that the guy got healed. They were worried about the power or the name that they did it in. 
Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and who are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from dead, the dead, that this man stands before you healed. If they'd only just healed the guy and left well enough alone, they'd have been okay. But they had to start talking about Jesus, and that landed them in jail, stirred up strife for them all through uh, the, the, the area there. But they could have uh, just uh, kept doing the, the healing, and that would have been a good thing. But it wouldn't have been what God called them to do. It wouldn't have been sharing Jesus. So down through history, we've learned a lot uh, from things like this. In the pendulum swung, when we looked at Peter and John, and we see what happened there, organization said, oh, hey, hang on a minute. If... We go soft on the Jesus side of things and just do the human need side of things. People will like us and people won't get put in jail or shot at or, you know, executed, all those kinds of things. We can be safe and still be doing good deeds and maybe they'll figure out Jesus somewhere in all of that. Now, I'm not anti-human need, trust me. You will you'll get there in just a minute. But the pendulum has been swinging ever since this. 1968 World Council of Churches mission was defined not as preaching Christ, but is doing a host of other good and worthwhile activities. And they said, we will let society define mission. Many evangelicals rightly reacted against that and decided that rescuing perishing souls was the only task we should be involved in. So we're just going to send out people with a Bible under their arm and a tie, of course, and all that kind of stuff to convert the masses. In 1974, the Luzanne Congress decided that both were important for believers to be uh, involved in, and the pendulum was trying to settle towards the middle ground. But on and on, it went back and forth, and it kept getting out of balance, one side or the other. The danger that we have is that while ministering to human need is something that Christians should lead the way in, and we need to be championing that, if we're not careful, mission will be redefined to a place that rejects evangelism, church planting, and reaching the unreached. And friends, I believe, based on everything that I see happening in the world today, that this is where you and I are living right now, is that we have embraced ministering to human need in such a way that if the gospel gets in, that's okay. But it seems to have ceased to be the priority. In this uh, book, and this is one that's really good that you should buy, um, the other book's good too, uh, by Kevin DeYoung and Greg Gilbert. And they said this, a few quotes out of their book, it says, we're concerned that in all our passion for renewing the city or tackling social problems, we run the risk of marginalizing the one thing that makes Christian mission Christian, namely making disciples of Jesus Christ. Another quote says, if we improve our schools, get people off welfare, clean up the park, plant trees in the neighborhood, but aren't seeking to make disciples, we may bless our communities, but we're not accomplishing the church's mission. Ultimately, if the church does not preach Christ and him crucified, if the church does not plant, nurture, and establish more churches, if the church does not teach nations to obey Christ, no one else and nothing else will. He also said, there is only one gospel, but it can be looked at through a wide or narrow lens, and it must include the gospel of the cross. Without the cross, there is no gospel at all. That would be like picking up an armful of leaves and insisting that you're holding a tree. They said evangelism is the act of telling other people about the plight they are in and how they can be saved from it. Sharing the good news of Jesus is an act of deep love and compassion for that person. That's simply holistic compassion, compassion for the whole person, not just part of it. And the quote of all quotes in that book that I, I want you to take away, we want the church to remember there is something worse than death and something better than human flourishing. Let that rattle around in your brain. Let that settle in your heart. There is something worse than death, and there is something better than human flourishing. So what? Do we send out only church planners and evangelists? Do we reject doing good deeds? with the Apostle Paul and some of the other things he was talking about, I would say, God forbid. 
We have a God-given responsibility to reach out to the poor, to help the needy, to fight for those who don't have a voice. Christians need to lead the way in that. We do need to keep sending out church planters and evangelists, especially to the over 7,000 unreached people groups around the world. And we need to keep rescuing girls from sex trafficking, attempting to bring hope to those uh, whose lives have been wrecked by AIDS and their families. And we do need to feed the hungry and care for orphans. But we need to do all of that in Jesus' name. And not just saying a prayer silently while we're doing it to ourselves, but making sure people know we're doing this in Jesus' name because Jesus is your hope. In Acts chapter 14, we see what missionaries do. And that's the lens that we should look at this through. In Acts 14, 21 through 23, it says, they preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples, encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. Paul and Barnabas' model for missions was they saw new converts while they preached the gospel to that city, made many disciples. They saw new communities being formed when they had appointed elders in every church. And they saw those churches growing. They said, strengthening the souls of the disciples. Friends, we need missionaries who will go. And even to do some of these human need projects and things like that. But will go with the gospel passionate in their hearts. Making sure that Jesus is at the center of it. And we need, if you're not in the missions program here, which I reckon most of you, even if you started school wanting to be a missionary, you'd leave and want to be a pastor. But anyway, we need pastors and churches who will recognize what mission is and support what mission is and send missionaries out to do what mission is. Thank you.